praise him on the stringed instruments. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good to worship the Lord with our instruments too, isn't it? Hallelujah. Go ahead and get your Bibles out. Lord, so some of you we see, I know you've been gone for a couple of weeks for different reasons. We're glad to see you back. Love seeing you. Um, once again, for all those who participated in any way, shape, form, or whatever with... Um, Pastor Appreciation Week. Those who wanted to, for whatever reason, you weren't able to, don't you feel bad. We love you. We thank you for w wishing you could. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. We're, we're, uh, we're just grateful to all of you uh, for your expression of love and, and just loving us. It's, it's greatly appreciated to be loved. It's now, good to be getting loved. into this Amen. one, last Sunday night, we began talking uh, uh, a sermon that I've done a number, a number of years ago, but about playing above the rim. You know, in basketball terminology, you've got to play above the rim. You can't, if, you, if you play down on the floor, you're toast. Unless you're Muggsy Bowes and they can't find you. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, how many remember Muggsy? You know, Muggsy was 5'5", was five, five, played at Wake Forest. I mean, he was like 5'5", five, five, and he just ran between everybody's legs. They couldn't get down there to get to him. You know, uh, but even that, he, he, he had to dish off and let somebody else shoot because he was so short that if he let the ball go, they had 20 seconds to recover because it took it that long to get up to, to normal height. I'm just messing with that. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, in basketball terms, you've got to play above the rim. If, you, if you're going to play successfully long term, you've got to play above the rim. Okay? What happens when you're above the rim? We talked about the fact that you've got a better view. You can see things better. I mean, when you're up above everybody else's head, you can see, you can see things a lot clearer. And uh, so that, that is kind of where everybody does and they play above the rim. Now, for, in Christian terminology, we need, to be, we need to live above the fray. We need to live above what's going on. You've got to get up above all the junk that's going on. I mean, you, it's, it's easy to get that bogged down here in the junk and try to figure out how to get out of it. Amen? You know, you can get down and all bogged all down in all the junk and everything. I remember one time... Um, uh, when Janie was 16, 17, 17, the first year we started dating, um, my family went to Disney World for Christmas, and uh, we took her with us. And uh, so we're at Disney World, you know, and of course back then you didn't have Epcot, you didn't have uh, the Animal Kingdom, it was just the, it was the Magic Kingdom. So everybody went to Disney, went down that main street. If you've ever been to Disney, and it's crowded, and you go down that main street, you don't go where you want to go, you go where the crowd goes. Well, my family, we got separated. I mean, we're walking, and, and part of us, well, actually, I was going this way, and my, my uh, girlfriend, who is now my wife, and family were going that way. So I got up to the side, and I climbed up on a pole a little bit, got up where, where I could get up ahead of them and find out where they were. See, there's a lot of times in life, you're going to have to get up above everything to see where things are going so you can see how to get where you need to be. Amen? Now, as long as you're down there in the crowd, you're just going with the flow. See, we can't go with the flow of the world. You can't go with the flow of other Christians. You've got to go with the flow of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You've got to go with the flow of what God has for you. You've got to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. You're not led, you're not led or guided by you know, uh, earthly wisdom or manly ideas. You've got to be led by the Spirit of God. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, there are, obviously, there are ways to be led by the Spirit of God. I'm not, I'm not going to teach on that this morning. But um, if you're led by the Spirit, you're, you're walking in line with the Word. Don't come to me and tell me that God told you something that the Bible teaches is wrong. He told you to do something. He told me it was all right to live with my girlfriend. He didn't care. Remember, how many ever, we watched Forrest Gump last night on television. I, have, I don't think I've ever seen the whole thing all the way through. I got one thing to say about that. Stupid is, stupid does. Hello. If you think that, you, that the God's leading you to go contrary to his word, stupid is, stupid does. That's stupid. But I've got a revelation. Yeah, you do. Hello? It's called devils. If you're getting revelations that are contrary to the word of God, devils are talking to you. Hello? 
Well, God showed me I didn't have to do such and such. such. I've heard people, oh, i got a special plan. You know, the, me and the maker are going to work it out one day. He said, today's a day of salvation. He didn't say one day we got it worked out. All right? Well, anyway, I don't know why I ran over there. Somebody needed it. Hallelujah. We're to live by the fray. We're to be led by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit means you're led by the written word or, or, or in co- accordance with the, the Spirit of the written word. In other words, it'll line up or make sense, and it, it will be confirmable in... in, in um, in, in, what's the word I'm looking for? In, in the spirit or the, uh, what's the other, what another way of saying that? The spirit of something or the um, essence, thank you, the essence of the word. Now the word doesn't tell you, you know, that um, Kevin, thou shalt go to Africa as a missionary. But if God starts speaking to you and in your heart, you, you believe you're called to be a missionary, the word does say, and you know, go, go in all the world and preach the gospel. See, that lines up with the essence of the word on a, on a general basis, then God gives you a specific statement that it's in harmony with the word. The Lord told me never to witness to anybody. Is that right? Well, the Bible says going all the word and preach the gospel to every creature. So you don't have a special revelation. Amen. All right. So here we are. If, if we're going to live above the rim, I, I'm going I'm to give you the two from last Sunday night, and then we're going to go forward. You got to set goals. Habakkuk 2.2, 2, write the Lord answer. He said, write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. You you gotta have a you gotta have a vision for what you're gonna do. I'm talking on a personal level. You know, we, we we do this all the time in the church, you know. But personally, you gotta have a vision of where you're going in life. Yeah. Now your vision will not exclude following after the corporate plan of God. You have specific things, but don't don't don't, don't start saying well, your my personal thing is more important. No, we being many are one body. We all even in our personal visions and personal things. Uh, <clears throat> this is where prosperity got off. Everybody got caught up with their own personal vision of wealth and, and, and houses and yachts and lands and boats and airplanes and multiple. You know, this, it's none of this, and see, here's the thing. None of those things are wrong. But when they supersede the vision of the body of Christ, what's necessary for the kingdom to build the kingdom, and it's all about you having this, and then none of that filters to the kingdom, there's a problem. I've seen people, you know, they're always telling you they're going to give so much money to the kingdom of God, and as soon as they get the money, they go buy something big. Well, see, what happened is you've, ex- you've, ex- you've exalted your personal vision above the vision of the kingdom. God doesn't mind you having it. That's not the issue. But if the church is not getting any of it, you're getting all of it, then there's something wrong. You've, you've, ex- you've, ex- you've exalted your vision above the, the, the corporate vision or the need of the body of Christ just because you want stuff. Honey, you can't take it with you. Again, I'm not preaching against it. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with having it. There's nothing wrong with having a house at the beach. But if you never give it, if, if, if every time you get money, you go spend it on something more or something big, and, something, and the church doesn't get in on it, then what's wrong? There's something wrong with that. Let me say something else. I'm going to just go ahead and jump on it with both feet. If your local church never gets in on it, there's really something wrong with it. You're always wanting to give to the, 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 this person and that person. You never give to your local church, or you, don't, you take care of other people way more than you do your local church. They're not the ones showing up at 3 o'clock in the morning in your hotel room. Hello? They're not the one you pick up the phone and call at 3 a.m. and say, my child has a fever. Pray for me. How many of you ever called me and asked me for prayer and I told you no? How many of you ever called me at 2 o'clock in the morning and I didn't answer your phone? Somebody calls at 2 o'clock in the morning? Now, I have most of your names on my phone. If I don't, you know, we go, what's a local area? Could I better answer? It might be an emergency. It's always, if I don't know who it is, and especially if it's local, well, I better answer this. It could be somebody in the church. I've, been, I've gotten calls at 1, 2, 3, or 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Pastor, there's something going on. I need for you to pray. Well, pff, I ain't praying. <laughs> Hello, what do you think? You, you, can, you can call me 8 to 5 Monday through Friday. <laughs> Talk to the secretary and make an appointment for prayer. So you can't do that. <laughs> for prayer, press 1. <laughs> <coughs> 2, for Pastor Ed, call back after 10. And before 10. <laughs> Press 3 for the, web, the website link so you can go ahead and get your answer by yourself without me having to get up. <laughs> now let me ask you something. If you're taking care of, I, I believe in traveling ministries. I believe there's different ministries. They have, they have roles in the body of Christ. But if you're spending all your money outside the church to other places, try calling them at 3 o'clock in the morning. Hello. Your, understand, your vision has to be 
in conjunction with and subordinate to the vision of the, of the kingdom of God and, 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 and the, in realistic terms, your local church. God wants to prosper you. God wants to bless you. So when you write your vision, make sure that it, it, it's in relationship, in the proper relationship. Now, I'm not talking about you don't ever get anything. You can't ever, you got to give everything to the church. Pastor Ray has to drive a Bentley while you drive a Vespa. Me to work. I'm not talking about that. We're not, we, we don't want to get in ditch on either side. But we make sure that, can I say something? The things, when I say things like this, we're talking about your heart. As much as anything. What's your heart? Is it really to advance the kingdom and help people? Or are you coming in for prosperity because you're going to get, get rich overnight and you don't have, going to have any debt and you can do all this fun stuff that you see all the rich folks do? God gives us the power to get wealthy and may establish his covenant on the earth. Now, I know we've taught that side of God wants to prosper you. And the, let me tell you something else. The other side of that, which is equally as important, probably more the import of that scripture, is taking his message to the nations. Amen. That's more of the import of that. I understand the other side of that. There, there's a truth to that, but that, that's not the main or the main thrust of that. We taught it in prosperity that it is. God gives you the power to get the wealth that we may reach the nations. Because people are his business. People, reaching people with the gospel is his good news. And that has nothing to do with playing above the rim. All right. It, well, it does because we want to make sure you keep the heart, right heart. You've got to keep the right heart if you're going to walk in the things of God. Right. Our heart has to be right before God. Amen. Second thing we said last week was, you got to be committed. Ow, Pastor Ed just cussed in church. <laughs> Commitment. Yeah. Committed. C-O-M-M-I-T-T-E-D. Committed. Spell check it, that's right. You've got to be sold out to the things of God. When I said committed, people went, <gasps> and three Volkswagens got pulled off the interstate. Just a low-pressure system just sucked them right off of there. Hello? Commitment. Sell out. Jesus, Jesus had a lot to say about that. We're not going to go into it, but, like, you know, um, one, side, one guy wanted to go bury his father. He said, you know, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Another said, let me go back and tell everybody goodbye. Jesus said, no man putting his hand to the plow, looking back, is worthy of the kingdom. Let me say this. E the children of Israel, when they got out of Egypt, when they ran into a little trouble, began to look for a path back to Egypt. There ain't nothing there, baby. You wanted out. You were tired of the pressures of, of, of spiritually dead life, and you wanted out. That's why you came into the kingdom. But all of a sudden, after a few years, you, get, you run into a little trouble, you run into a little frustrations, you run into this, you run into some battles, you, you're, you're not sure what's going on. All of a sudden, Egypt looks really good. Oh, yeah, they got, they got stuff to eat back there. Yeah, you were whining and complaining and griping and mumbling about, about, about how bad it was. And then you got out and you forgot how bad it was. And all of a sudden, it starts looking good again. <coughs> there ain't nothing good about it. I said, there's nothing good about Egypt. There is no peace there. There is no joy there. You might have to get drunk, get high, whatever, hang out with your old weird friends. Watch out with hanging out with your old... Now, that's one thing to go minister to them. It's another thing to be pals to hang out with them again. I've seen people do it. I've seen, uh, we had a guy back in our home church. He worked at a pizza restaurant. And, uh, you know, you know, and, and for some reason, everybody in the world thinks you've got to drink beer with pizza. <laughs> then you must be eating cheap pizza because you want to numb, numb your taste buds so you can't taste it. <laughs> and what does everybody tell everybody who ever starts drinking beer? Oh, well, you've got to acquire a taste for it. Meaning, it's so nasty, you've got to drink enough of it to deaden your taste buds. Because you've got to acquire a taste for it. So you're going to drink, you're going to acquire a taste for something that tastes nasty to deaden the taste for us so you can't taste the nastiness of the cheap pizza. Anyway, this guy worked in a pizza place. He served, they served beer. It was, a, it was a chain. And uh, he got where he, he, he got the craving because he used to, before he got saved, he used to drink beer all the time with his pizza. And so he started drinking, remember this, near beer. 
Now, near beer was supposed to be beer that was not alcohol or so minimal in alcohol that it didn't count. Okay? It was like 0.5%, it was like 0.05%, some real low, low, low number. And so you'd have to drink, you know, seven pitchers of it to even get a, you know, tingle. Okay? And then you get a fat because it's more calories in it. There you go. <laughs> Here's the problem. He went back to try to get as close to Egypt as he could get. But you know what happened? You awakened. You awakened the dead man. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves, ye, ye, ye yourselves indeed dead unto sin, but alive. I know I'm, I'm off, fully off my nose, so that's okay. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Well, you awakened those senses. And you know what started happening? Near beer won't good enough anymore. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then he went to, he went to uh, you know, um, <clears throat> he'd go to Coke 45 straight off. Okay. Sound really, really authority on there over there. Uh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, he, he did not go from Richard, I mean, from, from near beer to Richard's Wild Irish Rose or Mad Dog 2020. All right. Anybody know what Mad Dog 2020 is? I hope you don't. Okay. Richard Wild Irish Rose Wine. That was that cheap wine. It's cheap drunk. No, but see what happened was he went from near beer <coughs> and he started drinking some 3.5 beer. See, back in, back in those days, North Carolina still had 6.0. You could get cores at 6.0. You could get the, you know, the heavy-duty cores. And, yeah. And so they went to the 3.5 beer. Next thing, he was drinking the other stuff. Next thing, he was backslidden. Next thing he's out of church. Are you here? We don't want to look back to the world where we came out of. You came out of Egypt. God brought you into the promised land. Well, I got it. There's giants here. You can go get your stones and take them out. Amen. Like I said, Goliath, you know, David did not take five stones because in case he missed four times. I've got the scriptures. But we can go find them. There is a place that tells us that there are four other brothers of Goliath. One of them was the six finger giant. My name is. Uh, who? Anigo Montoya. You killed my father, but there to die. All right. It's a six finger. It's a six fingered man. Anigo Montoya. You killed my father, but there to die. And I won't say what else he said. Anyway, we came out of Egypt. We don't want to look back to where we came out of. We don't want to try to get back as close as we can get and get away with it. Why? Because there is a pull there. There is a draw from the world on your flesh. Your flesh can be drawn to those things. Hello? You ever talk to anybody that's been addicted to pornography or sexual sins? And man, I'm telling you, they, they mean, it's so hard because they're drawn. Are you here? I mean, they, you know, they just can't, it's almost like, I can't help you, they can't help themselves, but there's such a draw. What do you do? You don't even put yourself in the neighborhood. Hello? You don't get yourself in that circumstance, you just keep yourself away from those things. You separate yourself. Come out from among the world and be ye separate, says the Lord. So we got to be committed. Listen, if we set a goal, we go to focus, we got to be committed to it. That means you're sold out. Listen, no man warring entangleth himself with the affairs of this world. You've got to be entangled with the affairs of God. Your friends will tell you, look, I, I'm going to a church that don't have Sunday night service because I don't want to go on Sunday night. Pastor Ed, we, you know, we really shouldn't have to have Sunday night services. We don't need them. You know why we have Sunday night services? I, I look around and see all these pastors sitting at home on Sunday night. I think, man, that'd be cool. My flesh does. But what about the person who can't get to church on Sunday morning? They can get there on Sunday night. And what they need, they ha I have got what they have need of in our ministry. And I shut the door on that and say, nah, you know, you just got to figure out how to get here on Sunday mornings. I don't, have that, I don't have that liberty. I'm committed to the calling. Amen? Jesus Christ called me. I'm committed to that. I can't satisfy my fleshly desires at the expense of not being committed to the calling to minister life to people who are in need. Amen. We've had a bunch of people over the years who work Sunday mornings who could come Sunday nights. 
Hello? They could come Sunday nights. And so we, we had church. Why? Because they're in need. When we're committed to the things of God, when we're committed to a vision, when we're committed to things, it means sacrifice. We're preaching. I mean, in the church, there's too much of this. Uh, it's all about me, you know, happy, clappy, you know, don't, don't give any, don't, you don't have to put any skin in the game. You don't have to do anything. It's all just lovely, lovely, lovely. When the truth of the matter is, you've got to sell out. We're going to get into this in our teaching on healing. Which in the Bible says, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. The body is the Lord, the, the body for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God cares about your physical body and what you do with it. Amen. And how you commit with it. It's important that we're committed to the, to the things of God, the vision of God. Now, getting into this morning at, at, at three minutes after we're supposed to be gone. All right. How many give me five minutes? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. I got 25. All right, thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Should have said 10. I had a whole another hour. Glory. You got to get in good spiritual shape. Don't think you can watch Oprah seven days a week and have some faith. Don't think you can watch, you know, all the soap operas and going to have faith. Don't think you can watch all the newscasts and have faith. They're no longer news channels. They are political agenda commentary channels. All of them. Hello? There is no more news channels. You better be listening to the Holy Ghost. Are you here? How should I vote? Holy Ghost vote. Amen. But we're going to get into spiritual condition. What does that mean? Strength training. Spiritual strength training. You're going to have to, put, go out, you're going to, have to exercise your faith. You're going to have to put the word in. You're going to have to spend time, you know, as a good soldier. Amen. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. There's too much unrightly dividing. I had somebody, had somebody send me some questions this past week, and they said, you know, there's, there's, just, there's so many different interpretations or versions of, of, of what people interpret the Scriptures to say. Not if you do it right. If you do the proper exegesis of the Scriptures, if you study them properly, if you study them within context, if you follow the proper rules of interpretation, there won't be 55,000 different interpretations. No Scripture is of any private interpretation, or no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. No. The body of evidence throughout, throughout the Word of God will substantiate things. Now, just like people say, you know, the, the uh, healing passed away, the miracles passed away, the day the last apostle died, you can't find Scripture to substantiate that. Now, you can take one little passage and, and, and throw your twist on it, but if you put that passage with your interpretation against the rest of Scripture, it fails. You know, healing, you know miracles have passed away, signs have passed away, knowledge have passed away, all that stuff, over 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But that's just a man's private interpretation. And you can't balance that against the rest of Scripture. You see, that's what we have to do. We have to do proper interpretation. We've got to get in spiritual shape. Listen, just because I said don't make it so. You need to be like the Bereans. Stop being Thessalonians and be Bereans. Say, I'm a Berean. What does that mean, Pastor? The, in Berea, it says these were more noble than those, those in Thessalonica in that they, search, they, they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things be so. In other words, yeah, that, praise God, I received that, but then they went and proved it out. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, not by what Pastor Ed said. And we love it when somebody gets somebody. You know? Oh, we're the hyper crazy grace bunch. I can live with my girlfriend and fornicate, and it don't matter because I'm under grace. Really? Well, the, why does the Bible say the body's not for fornication? New Testament. Hello? It says the body is not for fornication. He that sinneth, sinneth without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his body. That's what the Bible says. New Testament. You got people running around saying I'm under grace. It don't matter if I fornicate. So you're not, you're not doing the proper exegesis of Scripture. 
You're not properly interpreting the word. You're not properly taking the word of God and putting it in the right context and getting spiritually strong. You're taking little, little cute little statements that somebody makes on a national scene and running off on the statement. The statement does not work. There's no faith in the statement. The faith is in what the word says about it. And we have to stay with the word. We've got to get spiritually strong. We don't have enough Christians staying spiritually strong in the word of God. We've got a lot of opinions. Oh, yeah, we've got a lot of opinions. Somebody was asking me, you know, recently, and, and, and they, they were genuinely asking, but they, they wanted to know, you know, um, about the will of God. Can, you know, can we change the, the will of God and, and, and so forth through prayer or, or group prayer? And then, of course, they said, now, my, basically what they kind of said was, my view is this, that uh, we, just, you know, we just stop praying about it and accept God's will. Well, then I, and, well, you know, I, and, and, and I gave back good scriptural answers. You know, like Abraham. God said, I'm going to hide from Abraham, my servant, the thing which I do. God was going to do what? He was taking out Sodom and Gomorrah. He goes to Abraham. Abraham says, will not the God of heaven do right? Perfect, there'll be 50 people there that are righteous. Will you, will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? Nope. If there are 50 people there, I'll, I won't do it. How about 40? Yep, if there's 40, I won't. 30? Yep, no, I won't do it. 20? Nope. 10? Here's the problem. He stopped one, one step short. Sodom and Gomorrah would not be in the Bible if he had said, will you spare it for Lot's sake? God would have. Abraham got timid that, that, down there, got down there, and he finally just said, you know, he could, he could, he could say, well, you spare it for my sake. I got family in there. How about Moses? God comes in, out of the way, I'm taking the bunch out, starting a whole new bunch with you. <laughs> Let me tell you something, as a pastor, you can have those same kind of feelings. There are days, stuff goes on, you want to come in and go, all right, off with their heads. Resurrect be a whole new church, Lord. You ever felt like that, Pastor? Oh, yeah. Closer than you think. See, that's not the right spirit. Anyway, so God says, Moses, get out of the way. I'm taking them out. He said, will not the God of heaven do right? He interceded for them. And the Bible says the Lord repented of the evil he, he had thought to do to his people. <laughs> you can intercede and get God to change what he was going to do. See, these, these, these sovereignists and Calvin, Calvinistic th theologies of, you know, everything's set and granted and it's just the way it's going to be, is not Bible. No. Neither is Armenians. That, like, you know, everything's just hunk of door, everything goes. Everything goes. You got, we got to get in the middle. Like I said the other day, I'm a communist. I'm in the middle. I'm not out on either extreme. <clears throat> I don't believe that if I go over here and step on Jerry's toe and he cusses and Jesus raptures the church, Jerry's going to hell. But my church did. Yeah. I grew up classical Pentecostal. It was unconfessed sin. You're burning in hell for that. Oh, yeah. Neither do I believe, you know, that as Martin Luther wrote, on, wrote in his writings, that a man can commit 10,000 fornications and not lose his salvation. Number one, you're busy. <laughs> very, very busy. Okay? Number two, if you're that busy, you're not spending any time with God. Right. <laughs> Just telling you. Number three, you're probably going to hell. <laughs> Those are extremes. Hello? Hello? But we need to get back into the Word of God. We need to be trained in the Word of God. We need to be disciplined in the Word of God. We need to be people of the Word. See, we've gotten away from that. I mean, Word people aren't Word people anymore. Ed Dufresne, I don't know if y'all know this, Brother Dufresne was killed uh, about a week and a half ago in a plane crash. His plane blew up. He took off from the airport. Um, and and Ed's been to our, Brother Ed's been to our church a couple times. Uh, we, had a, we knew Brother Ed, we, you know, seeing him in meetings and stuff. We had a relationship with him for well over 20 years. And um, he came to our church when we first moved into this building. And he's pro he was definitely a prophet of God. But he's, he saw something back in the, in, in the 80s. God showed him in the 80s, early 90s, he had a revelation of the church separating. What's it got to do with spiritual strength? It has everything to do with spiritual strength. Because if you don't have and live by the word of God, you have no spiritual strength. 
Now, you might have some willpower, and you might have some ideas, and you might think you know everything, but if the Word of God is not the force and the foundation of your life, you have no spiritual strength because that's where it's going to come from. Faith comes by hearing. You can't fight the good fight of faith without the Word. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to have the Word in you. Brother Ed said he saw there was, a, there was a split coming in the church, and primarily referring to the, the charismatic Word of Faith type churches. Those who would follow after the Word and after the Spirit and those who would follow after the flesh. Randy Greer came along in, 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 the, uh, in about 2003, 2004 and started saying some of the same things around 2007, 2008 um, about the revelational church and the informational church. Really saying the same thing. He was, he was speaking the same thing. We've got it. We're seeing it happen in the church right now. We've got people who are more interested in, in, in everything in the Word except the Word of God and the move of the Holy Ghost. Because the thing is, it's important. Let me tell you something. You need the Word of God, and you need the manifestation and move of the Holy Ghost in your life. Churches need. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. We, we, um, see, I'm talking about spiritual strength. I'm not, I'm not wondering. I know what I'm doing here. Now, just hang with me. He's just babbling. No, I'm not babbling. I'm talking about spiritual strength. Um, the kids went to a certain high school. They sent out a, 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 a S. Uh, one of our teachers is doing their doctorate. Uh, I know the teacher. And, and they asked the kids, you know, about their experience at the school and, what, you know, about their Christian walk and, and, and how the school helped them or didn't help them, whatever. And so somebody got on, answered and then got on Facebook and ranted for about, you know, I don't know how long. And then their, their sibling got on there and ranted with them. And um, just ab about, you know, the, you know there's, the, the, the conservative God's not God. And, you know, the, you've got gay Christians and libertarian Christians and, you know, anarchist Christians. I, I, I thought I'd put on there, what about the pedophile, the incest, and the raping Christians? Because if you're going to start talking about deviant sins as being a Christian, you've got to have all those too. But anyway, I didn't. I also was going to put on the bestiality Christians. If you're a sexual pervert and you can be a Christian, you can be a sexual pervert and a Christian in any realm. Just saying. Just saying. You know, but anyway, they went on and on and on. And, and, I, and I turned to my wife and I said, you know, I know that when my kids went to school, they, they did good things, whatever. But one of the things they always denied and always came against was manifestations of the power of the Holy Ghost. They had a teacher, come, had a guy come in one day and, began, and, and, and had the kids come up and began to speak over them by the Holy Ghost. One of the, one of the kids was a classmate of Nathan. And, and, and they live in kind of a, 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 not an atheist, but a non-Christian house. So they send the kids there because it's a good school, not, not because of the Christianity. Touched their life. I mean, the word of the Lord absolutely read their mail. And they came to one of the, one of the charismatic teachers at the school, because I know because a teacher told me, shared the whole story with me, about what to do, what, what did all that mean, because they'd never seen anything like that in their life. But God had touched their life. You know what, the, what somebody, the, the, the head of the school did? Had a teacher staff meeting. We're not ever going to have that in here again. And you wonder why the kids go out and, and, and go to the world. Because you took the power away. You took the anointing away. You took the, the, listen, I've seen people take their kids and put them in places they don't need to be. Had somebody leave a number of years ago, going to go to a church that you know, had a good youth program. But it was a non-Holy Ghost youth program. And then they were in an affair with a youth, youth guy who was 10 years their senior. But they had a good youth program. No, he had a good uh, target-rich environment. Hello? They weren't teaching the Word. They weren't teaching the flow of the Spirit. But they had programs. My brother, my sister, you, you, a program is a program is a program. The Word, the Holy Ghost is the most important thing you'll ever put into your kids. The flow of the Spirit is the most important thing. Your kids hearing from heaven and the ability to hear the voice of the Spirit is the most important lesson they will ever learn in life. They can go climb rock walls later. Nathan does all the time. He goes over to the rock wall climbing place and climbs rock walls. And he's still serving God, even though we didn't have one in the church. And he's flowing in the Spirit. I'd rather see him flow in the Spirit than climb a wall any day. We need to get back to being strong in the Word and having our strength come from the things of God. And not from feeling good about how, how we're doing stuff. There's nothing in life that can make you feel good that's long-lasting if it's not from the Word and the Holy Ghost. Well, I've got to feel better about myself. The Word of God is your identity. Jesus is your identity. You need to get your strength from there. 
not from the affirmation of your co-workers or your former friends. Fire! Boom, 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 boom. All right, got it out of your system? Let's go. We're, if we're going to be strong in God, I know I'm going late. That's okay, y'all gave me 25 minutes. If we're going to be strong for the battle, if we're going to be strong for life, let me tell you, people are fainting today, folks. I mean, every time you turn the television on, you pick up a, a news report, I'm telling you something is bad. Yeah. They've, they've fired 109 colonels in the military. Do you know what the next step for these colonels will be? Where they go next? They're the pool of the future generals. And they're all being fired because they disagree with the, the current administrative policies. Not the person, the policies. 109 have been let go, dismissed. Now, I always got a few here and there that were, they were doing something they shouldn't have been doing. That's always going to be. Vast majority just because they had a disagreement with policy. One of the retired, three-star retired general just came out and said, the Pentagon and the Department of Defense is filled with Muslim Brotherhood sympathetic people. It's top secret clearance. The Secretary of Defense is a practicing Muslim. Now, let me tell you something. Department of Defense, or Homeland Security, has about two billion rounds of hollow point, armor-piercing projectiles for practice. If you believe that, I have got oceanfront property in Denver I want to sell you. $40,000 an acre. You don't buy two billion rounds of hollow point ammunition for target practice. Let me tell you, there's, a stuff, there's stuff going on. There are plans going on. But you know what? We, if you pick, you pick up the newspaper, you see that stuff every day. You see it every day. You can, your heart will fail you if you don't get full of the faith in the Holy Ghost. If you don't know that God's your source and God's your reward and God will sustain you and God will protect you and God will deliver you. And, God, and listen, let me tell you something. The same God, the same God that showed up in Israel in 1967 will show up for the Christians in America in 19, or 2013 and 2014. My friend Fawaz, Brother Bill knows Fawaz, <coughs> nicknamed the, the Jordanian Jew bomber by us. Why? Because when he was a child, he lived in Jordan. He's a Jordanian. And his goal in life was to grow up and join the Jordanian Air Force and go bomb the Jews. <coughs> then he got saved. So we affectionately named him the Jordanian Jew bomber. Now he preaches the gospel. He goes to Jordan and preaches to people. And he has missionary trips to Jordan and, and shares the gospel there. Hallelujah. But Fawaz had people. He grew up and he knew people who fought in the Six-Day War. They came to him and said, we came across the dunes and we were ready to attack. And said, there were millions of soldiers on the dunes. Millions. These are, these are personal testimonies to him. He said, we couldn't win. We were outnumbered by millions. Israel don't have that many soldiers. God sent his angels. See, that's where you get into the word. You get your confidence and your faith back when the, all the news around you is bad. And you're saying, my God, God, our country is about to be taken over. I mean, communism and socialism is trying to take over. You know, but you know what? We will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of our Lord, our God. Amen? Not by, my, not by armies, but by my power, says the Lord. We've got to get back to believing that God. See, if you're going to win battles and you're going to win in life, you've got to get your eyes off all the other stuff. It'll rob you of every ounce. Of, it'll rob you of faith. It'll rob you of hope. You'll become hopeless. Hello? I said, you'll become hopeless. <coughs> Everybody knows that, you know, well, everybody knows. Anyway, the health care is designed to fail because the government wants single payer. What's single payer? Socialism. It is pure socialism. In 2007, the president said in 2007 when he was a senator, he said we won't be able to do away with the employer covered insurance immediately. It's going to take some time to get to single payer. I mean, that was the essence of his words. He wants single payer. Why? Because, because they control everything. We can't, but you can't live there. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? You're going to trust God. You're going to get healed because you can believe Jesus. I can't afford insurance, but you can afford the Holy Ghost. You can afford the Word of God. You can stand up and say, the Lord, is my, the Lord is my healer. He's my Jehovah Rapha. I'm the healed of the Lord, praise God. Amen. 
we got to get back to when, when, when the battle shows up, we just stand strong and say, no! And be strong. Amen? Hallelujah. So we have to develop our spiritual strength. And then you've got to develop endurance. You've got to be able to run the race to the end. Now, Nathan, his senior year in high school, they'd been after him his whole time in high school to wrestle. And he didn't want to wrestle because he didn't want to wear those, those uh, outfits. He just didn't want to wear the, the, the tight, skimpy, you know, outfits. He, he just, you know, it's like, it, it just kind of bothered him. He didn't, he didn't want somebody, you know, wrestling him and, and uh, you know, lifting him from certain positions and that kind of stuff. He didn't want it. Finally, they stayed after him until the senior year, and, and, uh, and, and they, they got him. And, he, you know, finally my wife consented to, uh, to him let him wrestle. Well, he, he, he was strong. He, they had him wrestling. He, was, he weighed uh, 192 by the time they got him in shape. He started at about 212 or whatever. They got him down to 192. Then they had him wrestling 220. He was wrestling guys almost 30 pounds heavier than him. Usually guys who had gotten from 230 down to 220, he was 192. So he's, he's, he's being outweighed by 28 pounds. That's a lot of weight. But let me tell you something that it kept happening with him. Now, he, he ended up making an all-conference and finishing fifth at the States. First time he ever wrestled. First year he ever wrestled. The only year he ever wrestled. But you know what? When he first started out, he couldn't go 30 seconds. He was winded. By the end, he could go the whole match. And, and he, he built his endurance. His strength, his physical strength, was able to be used better as he began to develop more endurance to use that strength. And so instead of going out there real strong at the beginning and then fading after 30 seconds, he was able to maintain and take that strength throughout the entire match. He had one night, this guy was out pointing the daylights out of him. The guy was moving all around him. You know, he's still young with techniques. And finally, I mean, near the end of the match, that guy had run around him like Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee the whole match. Finally, and he had Nathan kind of in a weird position, and Nathan just kind of grabbed him and went, wham! And fell on him and pinned him. I mean, real late in the match, he was out pointing, was going to lose. But see, because he had developed his endurance. And he finally got to that point. Where that guy, and the guy was about to take him down and pin him because he just had him in an awkward position. And Nathan just kind of went, that's it. Boom. Just, you know, the, the, but he had not had the endurance. He wouldn't have been able to do it. He had to have the endurance. You've got you to you develop spiritual endurance. Amen. <clears throat> so that you can go ahead uh, and win your battles. You've got to win your battles because you're in for the long haul. I'm not going to try this face. You don't try this face. Stuff. I tried it once and it didn't work. You can't try it. You got to go all the way. You got to sit your arm and go and say, that's it. I'm not quitting until I'm passing the finish line. Amen. You can't stop at McDonald's and say, man, that's too far to get that to the finish line. I'm just going to drink me a Big Mac, have me a Big Mac, and have me a huge supersized Coke. And watch supersize me while I eat it. Y'all ever seen the video supersize me? It's about the guy for 30 days, he ate all supersized meals at McDonald's and gained like 40 pounds, his cholesterol went out there. Nobody does that. But anyway, they show it in schools to scare you from McDonald's. You know? I mean, Nathan actually says that when, he, when his kids are in the car with him, when he has kids, when every time they ride by McDonald's, he's going to reach back and slap them. <laughs> Wham! <laughs> Just don't slap me because I'm going after you. Get me a double cheeseburger and, big, and, and double large drink and some, you know, Hallelujah. Hot French fries right out of the grease, soaked in dextrose, by the way. Y'all know that's why you like McDonald's French fries so good? They've been soaked in dextrose. They've got sugar in them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't eat it. I don't eat at McDonald's once every two weeks. But, if that. But I might go by there a day just because I said something about it. Keep your, as you get your spiritual nurse, keep your eyes on the goal. Philippians 3.14. I press toward the mark of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus, of God is in Christ Jesus. Keep your eye on the goal. Once you set the goal, keep your eye on it. Go, don't get distracted by the fluff and puff. Don't get distracted by people coming on and say, ah, you don't need to confess that stuff. You don't need to speak the word. You don't need to believe God. That's just, let me, they were sent by the devil to rob you of your revelation and walking in the truth. That rhema crowd. And then you try to prove that you're not a Rhema person. I am. R-H-E-M-A. Rhema. Well, they're not the only one with truth. They, no, they're not. The truth I got has saved my life, has put me over the top, has healed my body, has met my need, 
has kept me going when I couldn't go anymore in my own strength. I'm not going to, you know, it's like one guy said, one, what we asked, one pastor was here with us, and he was, we were eating after us, and said his son had gone out, and, and um, he, he came back as, as a worship leader. He said something about, the, the dad said, I want you to sing such and such. He goes, what, one of them shout songs? See, they got the meaning of all those old camp meeting style songs, the shout songs. Dad looked at him and said, you mean the song that they would sing and the anointing of God would begin to flow and the prophet would begin to minister in the Holy Ghost? You mean the songs they would sing and people would, would get set free from bondages and demonic attacks? You mean the songs they would sing where they would have a healing service, people would get healed? You mean the songs that, that brought freedom and life and liberty to people, that brought joy into the heart? You mean, you mean you, those songs? Well, well that's what people call it. He said, I know, you better not ever call them that in my church again. See, a lot of time, are you here? We think we can get something and then coast in. Keep your eye on the goal. Don't let detractors take you off your path. Don't let them take you out of the place that you know you need to be to win the battle and to win the, win the race of life. Hello. Stay where you're going to get fit and then finish your course. Paul said, I followed a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. You don't stop until you're done. Anybody can lie down and quit. It takes no faith. It takes no energy. It takes no effort to lie down and quit. Hello? There are going to be times it's going to take a lot of everything. Endurance, faith, strength, not quitting, staying with it to make it through. But if you're going to win life, you're going to have to get up there and play above the rim and play with God, play where God lives. You understand? I'm playing using the word play allegorically. Not we're playing. You have to live your life in a place that God can work in you. You can follow after Him. You can stay on course. There are things God's given you He didn't give you so you could just quit and throw it on the wayside and say, well, that's not, that's not really important. God gave you those things to put you over. You have them so you can win. He infused you with faith and revelation. Come on now. Not so you can run off somewhere and say, well, I tried that once. I don't believe that stuff. It, only works. it works. The Word works if you'll work the Word. And the thing God placed in your heart, He didn't place there so you can just kind of go around and say, well, you know, I was following that. I, I used to believe that, but I don't believe that anymore because you've you got to watch other Christians. Get away with being slothful. Get away with being lazy. Keep watching. You might get away with watching them die. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people that left our church. And I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to say, oh, you go, don't leave our church or you'll die. There's other churches you could go to that you'll, you'll get faith. Okay? I've seen people take up and pack up and walk out because they were mad about this and mad about that and, and got, didn't want the word anymore and didn't want this. And, 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 and they, when they came to our church, they were a mess. They were messed up. We prayed with them, believed God with them, put the word in them. They got, they got set free. They got delivered. They began to live by the word. Went back out in those th same things they came out of and ended up dying. Now, now, not because our church was great. They could have gone in any word church, any place they were getting the word. They could have left any other church that talked along those lines and, stay, you know, and done the same thing and same, had the same thing happen. Why? Because the thing they needed to live by was what we were giving them. But because they got their eye on somewhere else, they got their eye off the goal and got it on somebody else's disgruntledness or whatever, they ran off the door. Then I said, well, how's so-and-so doing? Oh, you're in there? They split up, and he died. Oh, but they were, they, you know, they, we, we came into the church, we, you know, they were living in sin, and they were trafficking cocaine. Got them set free. Got them out of jail. The judge let them out of jail because I went down and testified for them. Didn't sentence them. Oh, they, they're, they're, they were trafficking, you know. They went back out and started doing drugs again. They split up. He died. We got to stay with the things of God. And again, not saying, that's not faith and victory. I'm not, I mean, you can't leave what God has for you, the Word and the Holy Spirit. We're not the only ones who have it. There are others who have that. Okay? We're not the only church in the world. I'm not even going to say we're pretty close to it. There's a lot of good churches. I know a lot of good pastors. 
preach the word and flow in the Holy Ghost. But you can't leave that venue and go back out into to something else and think things are going to be good. When God brought you out, there's nothing back in Egypt, honey. And there's nothing in pseudo-Christianity or, 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 or stuff where there's no, tr no power in it. Let's stay. Let's live our life above the realm. Let's live it in the spirit. Let's live it in the word. Let's win our battles. Let's take the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but mighty through God, and use them to pulling down our strongholds. Amen. Let's recognize who the enemy is. It ain't me. I am not the enemy. Now, the devil will tell you I am, but I'm not. You know? Oh, Pastor Ed did such and such. I am not the enemy. Isn't that right? You got anything to say? Thank you. Nothing to say? All right. Uh, hallelujah. Here, take before I drop him. It'd be an expensive venture. Hallelujah. Father, we pray. We pray for this congregation that the revelation that we have to live life above the fray, we have to live it in faith, we have to be strong and endure, we have to keep our eyes on the goal that we set, we have to keep our right attitude. Help us, Lord, walk out the purposes and plans of God and fulfill our destiny. And finish them with joy. Finish our course with joy. And be a blessing along the way. Amen. Help other people, bring, bring other people into the kingdom. Share the truth. And speak the truth. And be examples of the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.